<laughs> Tim Williams, everyone. Tim Williams has um, incredibly generously joined us despite a pressing deadline and chaos between he and I in terms of communication, which is entirely my fault. Late, my homework is late. Right, right. <laughs> right you know, we don't accept that as an excuse. <laughs> um, Not at all, yeah. Tim is the chairman for the committee? For no, I'm the chief executive. Chief executive, okay. But also um, is with ARA as their placemaking specialist and has extensive experience at both in the UK and in Australian urban renewal and issues like this to do with um, multi-stakeholder governance systems and models for public spaces. And Tim, I'm wondering if you can share with us your experience with some of the things we spoke about on the phone yesterday to do with how um, you know, we had Shiva came and spoke to us this morning, and it became quite clear to us um, that, that there's limitations in what they were sort of seem to be able to do with um, with their high, with their um, in terms of uh, you know a lot of uh, the the areas of the city that they've, they've got control over relative to what infrastructure New South Wales has in terms of their what do they call it a stepping capacity. Um, so could you speak, could you speak to us? Yeah, um, I, uh, I'm a great uh, fan of uh, Ben and what they've been doing down in, in Adelaide for good reasons. Uh, and they've bought me supper before. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't know what I'm doing, shall I? Yeah, please sit down. Just, you know, gather yeah. around. The I, have a, I have a bit of a mixed background, which is with, uh, I don't know if anybody saw me speak at some event in, in this place recently. But, um, so I come from, I'm from the Committee for Sydney. Committee for Sydney has got uh, the, the great and the good uh, from uh, strategic minded companies and organisations in Sydney. There's also got Schiffer as a member, interesting. Right. Uh, but I also have a considerable background in, in, uh, in East London, particularly, where before I arrived here. Um, and I put together delivery um, bodies to actually do urban development. So I helped create an urban development corporation. East London. I was advisor to Lend Lease on the Olympic Village. Um, so I, and I was an advisor to the UK government on urban regeneration and planning. So I, I've, uh, but I've also been a developer. And I've also been somebody who tried to do a public-private working. Mm -hmm. So it's it's difficult out there. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just thinking just to Ben that the, you know the, uh, the where to start. Uh, I'm a great believer that the design, the excellence in design, does not come just from skills. Um, or just come from good people. It comes from good processes, yes, and it also comes from business models. Mm -hmm. It's got to be, you've got to understand. So that the reason why the house builders build bad buildings is, is not because they're bad people, but because their business model virtually squeezes out anything to do with design. So we need to understand the material basis for, for good and bad design. So that's a big proposition. The second thing is more about the, uh, the way in which um, the easiest thing in the world to, to build well, if you like, the easiest scenario is I own a piece of land and nobody else matters. I own a piece of land and nobody else matters. I can do what I like on my land. That's a very easy scenario, which rarely occurs in nature. But you know, that's an easy one. The next difficult one is I've got two or three partners that I need to persuade of the vision that I've got. Because if I persuade them, we get more value out of this, but also I, I, my ambition is not just for my land. So you've got, you know, and that's pretty hard. Mm -hmm. And then the hardest thing of all is what we just heard about, is where you've got a myriad mm -hmm. of partners to persuade. Mm -hmm. uh, and not all of them with a material self-interest in the proposition. Not all of them are gonna make money yeah. out of this deal. There are some other paybacks that they have to have if they're a public sector <coughs> body. These, this is a complex terrain. And I think that the UPS is probably involved in a complex terrain of partnership building uh, to try and you know, get uh, the result around a vision. So that this is not easy. Mm -hmm. Now the Schiffer argument is interesting because I think that often the, the, the most difficult thing for a, a body like that to accept is that it hasn't got all the capacity and skills it needs to, to deliver. And so a big moment comes when people say we need some heavy lifting deal, or some bespoke special purpose vehicle to actually corral the land, bring the planning tools together, um, do all the deals. The deal making is mm. a very exhaustive yes. process. Um, and uh, by the way, I mean, uh, it's a tacky and tawdry word to use. That's, you know, we, we didn't hear Ben use the phrase deal making, but essentially it's a kind of yeah. deal making process around, but around a vision. Mm. Um, in business, 
because again, you know, we sometimes, you know, we got there. But this, you know, a lot of this is going to be rooted in business, so it's down to the, the negotiation of what's the offer, what's the ask. Mm. Yeah. What's in it for me? Yeah. What about what? wrangling? Say again. Wrangling. Absolutely yeah. right, but but also kind of you know a series of trade-offs around the strategic vision. So all that time-consuming. But let me give you the optimal conditions in which to create a, a great place, and just to, and then we can talk about how far we are away from, from that. Right. So if you, if you look at the uh, one of the great um, one of the great uh, built forms and places in Western society is the London Square. The London Square, immense value. Everybody loves them. They're not being recreated in modern uh, building society. Why? And the answer is that they're still owned, many of them, by the same people that owned them 300 years ago, right? So they have a single owner, long-term engagement with the place. They have, uh, they never sold any of the plots to anybody. They leased them. Mm. So these are not freehold disposed of. They're leased, they're leased to people who have to uh, pay a ground rent to the single landowner who uses that money over hundreds of years mm -hmm. to build public wealth mm -hmm. and to put in the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. There's a pattern book which permits only five types of housing to be built in the London Square. Mm -hmm. and, and it sustains and, it, and it, it maintains a quality framework, if you like. Mm -hmm. This is a 100, 200 year old model. Mm -hmm. Very difficult mm -hmm. to replicate in modern conditions because of the land assembly problem which brings us back to to this to the where I started in a way. In order to get a coherent quality vision for a large proposition with multiple owners, um, there isn't just about values shared and there isn't just about the skill. There is about the material payback for the deal mm -hmm. that you're asking people to make in order to get the land assembly together. So what's in it for me? Mm -hmm. e even if it's a public sector body asking the question remains the question, what's in it for me? And why, by aligning myself with other public forces around this vision, will I add value mm. to what I do, mm. or to what, what it is that is my core activity? Mm. Um, and I think then, the, then when you've done that, then I think, I think the, the, the kind of word that is missing from the conversation, although Brock Ben probably hasn't got, got to it, because I'm sure it's there in the thinking, is it actually the word contract? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because, you know, don't let it, you know, anybody think that we can make the kind of progress we're talking about here in a process that doesn't sometimes crystallize in a deal and a contract. Mm -hmm. And then people will be, uh, have to, like, in a legal agreement, uh, commit themselves. Because there is a joke about partnership, which I love, mm -hmm. which is this, that somebody wants to find partnership, certainly in the public sector, this is true. As the, as, the, uh, mutual, as, the, as the suppression of mutual hatred in, in pursuit of a grant. Right. <laughs> um, and that can be a good binding force. So, so I, I think, if I stop now and just say that I think that, uh, in a sense, excellence, <coughs> excellence in, the, in the result and the built form that we seek is not just a matter of architecture. Mm. It isn't just a matter of values. It isn't just a matter of skills. It's a matter of building model, uh, business models, deals, contracts in the real world. Mm -hmm. And effectively, it all boils down to what's in it for me, the offer that we make with our vision uh, and the ask of somebody else that we wish to. to. And the bottom line of that is compromise. Mm -hmm. The bottom line of that is, is that it will, the result that will emerge will, will hopefully be as close to your vision as possible. Mm -hmm. And you also have you have to have a strong sense of the difference between the strategy and the tactics mm. for this. So the strategy is that ultimate development that we wanted for in the beginning, but we will trade off along the way. So we hope at the end of the process it, we haven't turned an apple into a pear. Mm. And we've had this conversation um, where I think you were kind of saying design shouldn't be involved at all. And we kind of had the conversation. Well, we had a conversation about what we mean by that. Well, what we mean by design. And I guess the point I was trying to make is um, <coughs> a definition of design is um, uh, the negotiation of competing interests, right? Mm. The idea that Tim was just talking about in terms of compromise yeah. is the essential part of actually making something work. And um, I, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking about my experience, it's not actually designing a thing, it's designing ways of working and processes for other people to do that. <coughs> 
but right. absolutely implicit in all of that is what is the uh, it's less of a contract within government because it's you know even if you do sign off on something it's still flexible <coughs> but there is that idea of accountability and some sort of governance model yes um, and uh, uh, the value of actually bringing that um, design thinking into that space which yeah. kind of allows you to deal with the different scales connect the vision to the detail stay you know strategically principled and tactically agile mm. um, to actually get results or create the space for other people to get mm. results. Because what it was, um, what we still have a discussion about, I think, mm. is that the kind of strategic thinking that this process is about. Uh, it depends. You can you can call that design, and I understand that. And I think it's a better form of design thinking than thinking that design is somewhat later in the process and it's got something to do with drawings. Yeah. Right. But I think. Uh, right. I think that. Yeah. That that's an important discussion, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and I give you I give you an example of where where we screwed up in the in the in Britain about something about this moment, and that's uh -huh. why I some, I'm not entirely sure of the phrase design re review in this because it sounds very late in the process of understanding how we got to this position in the first place. I'll uh -huh. give you an example. I was the client for, in the, for the UK government for something called the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, now RIP, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> And I, I, I think I helped kill it, which I, I'm not sure it was entirely a good thing, but I, I helped kill it because these are the people that were every quarter would come out with a review for government, remembering that government invented them to improve the result of design in, in, in Britain. We, uh, we were finding that they were reporting that, that it was awful, that, mm -hmm. that design was not only really bad, it seemed to be getting worse. The, uh, so we had Kate, and things seemed to be getting worse. We didn't understand this. Mm -hmm. you know, we understand. Politicians are very simple-minded people, you know. Uh, <laughs> we pay you to do things better. It's getting worse. There must be a link between these things, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it was, you know. So, what I worked out was that, and, and it's very interesting because in the end, Cave had this new discussion which I'd influenced, which is, which is basically, who do we let build for us, right? Not just the planning skills and the was it a good drawing, but is that a cultural entity or form of of business capable? given this business model of delivering what we want, right? right? We decided that it wasn't, that the house builders in the UK particularly had no, that, that design quality was a very minimal part of their entire business model. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a very, because they regarded it as a big risk, so they didn't want to, you know, mm -hmm. so they were doing that and they were cookie cutting because it was a very, very deep thing in their, in their business model. Right. Because we didn't understand that at the beginning, we, 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 we came in at the end with a design review saying, that's not very good. Mm. And, and we just kept on saying, that's not very good. Mm -hmm. Instead of working white, uh, why it was that 80 out of 100 times, they didn't do a good job. Mm. So, so I'm really interested in, in going back into the process to understand. So that also plays to the partners we have to build with us, right? right. So, so for example, um, building the Olympic Village in, in East London, um, it was, uh, it, you know, it mattered that the public sector procured Lendies to do this rather than somebody else. Because, by the way, although I think Lendies have become more of a conventional company than they used to be, they have a, a DNA still there somewhere, which is about uh, community, mm -hmm. is about uh, green things, and is about uh, uh, good environment for their workforce. And they had some values, mm -hmm. which I think got reflected. So their business model was slightly different. A deeper version of this, but we're not stop, but, but a deeper version of this is this. We suddenly realized that the, that the house builders were never going to create because their, their models were just going wrong. So instead of trying to change them, mm. we decided that we might want to procure somebody else mm. to deliver for us. So, so we invented this thing called the 60,000 pound house. How about this? Uh, the 60,000 pound house was a really interesting attempt not just to get, by the way, a cheaper house, because we were a bit worried about they were all getting very expensive to build, hence the $60,000. But the contest brought in mixed-use developers, commercial developers, right? The commercial developers are interesting because they have a, a, a long-term interest in a building, right? Mm -hmm. They might own and run a building for 25, 30 years, right? So they care about how it's run, mm -hmm. how it's designed, all that kind of stuff. If you're, in a, house, if you're a house builder, you build it and bugger off. Right? That is the model. You build and bugger off. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so we, we invented this new procurement, which brought in p 
people like Skanska or uh, you know like Lang or like uh, you know um, I don't know Bo Bovis even right mm -hmm. who never actually designed and built their own housing before at all they were construction mm -hmm. people for other people and all that kind of stuff so I, I I think what I'm getting at is that there is a there is a a deep, you need a deeper understanding of the delivery um, yeah. DNA yeah. Of, of, the, of the people that you want to be partners with mm. to develop these things. Now, this is not rocket science. Mm. This is not like some, you know, this is just stepping back a minute and understanding, you know, uh, and looking at the records of people. And the last thing I say about this is I invented something which the, uh, actually was resistance to, and, I, and it's a really, the resistance to it is interesting. I, I, I said that in terms of public procurement in the UK, of housing, remembering social housing is massive, <coughs> that we should have a quality threshold for the partners that we wanted to procure at first, and then we would put it, put everything out to competition. Mm -hmm. So the competition on quality came first, and then the competition on price came second, mm -hmm. right? The problem with the, the <laughs> this is a really interesting problem, the problem with a competition on quality is what if you've never built anything before, mm -hmm. right? So there was, a, there was a kind of moment where I thought, I don't quite know how to get Innovative new players mm. into this model, right? But I so so I, I kind of end this bit by saying so I think that there are processes of procurement and partner building which can get you to the, the DNA of the people that you wish to partner with, and you don't really want to compromise around that. Mm. You don't really want to, unless you absolutely have to, because they they for example own. They might be owners of land that are anchor tenants that just will budge for your vision and you bend. Mm. That's life. Mm. So the material basis of good design results is what I'm really, is what I'm really interested in. Mm. So if we take that back to the specifics of what we're dealing with, which is the EPM, this neighbourhood, how UTS engages with a set of complicated stakeholders to get stuff done. <laughs> it's interesting. I've been obviously listening to the, uh, the last two speakers with uh, uh, an attempt to pull all of that into how UTS works. And uh, it's all, I won't say common sense, because you've taken a process, uh, you created uh, a way of doing things, uh, you pull people together, but they're there's a constant theme here, which is the creation of precincts. Um, not just building a house, but building or pulling people in that have a longer term view of things. And you take that and you put it within the precincts. You're trying to pull the right people together to actually be involved in the process that you've created. You're talking about um, not dealing with them individually, but dealing with them as a group. You know, all of these things come back to, yep, I get that. Uh, that doesn't make sense. I have to say that we are dealing with the precinct. Um, we decided that. We are dealing with people that are going to be here for uh, quite a bit of time. They are not house builders. Uh, we're lucky in that sense. Um, I would say that if we are attempting to pull together those people to not bite each other's head off, to actually get along with each other. Um, we should be talking to them individually first um, before we pull them into a room. Otherwise, we just set ourselves up for a um, bit of a bunch <coughs> fight in colloquial terms. Uh, when everybody gets into a room, decides that they're going to use this as their, uh, their soapbox. Uh, so, yeah. Well, I mean, we've experienced a, a, a lot of that, that side of things. It's, mm -hmm. Maybe less pronounced in Adelaide, where everybody is very polite and then goes. <laughs> Welcome to Sydney. Yeah, no, no, I miss it, right? But, um, but and then there's this background stuff, which is about the one-on-one -on -one stuff, where you make all the deals to make sure that the meeting goes all right. But there is something in allowing the conflict to surface. Yes. Um, uh, but it's kind of that shared building of um, uh, values around the project, where you. Where the stakeholders are understanding the compromises that others are making, which helps them to make compromises themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's kind of an important part of it. I do think it's important. I mean, you, you've got a, a, a bit of a capacity down in, you know, you've created a capacity, it's not huge, you know, but, um, but, but in these processes of building um, a shared vision on a piece of land, mm -hmm. 
but you need um, somebody to hold the ring. Yeah. And you need an honest broker, probably. Um, or somebody, well, yeah, somebody who's got an interest in it, but it's not an exclusive interest in it, that can see that by bringing all these pieces together, you add value to the, you know, it's a, the, 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 the whole is bigger than the, the sum of the parts of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, who is that player mm -hmm. in this? Sorry, UTS I'm, I'm a late comer chiming in. Who is that player in this UTS conference? But, but I think it's interesting, I mean, underscoring all of this really is the issue of leadership. Yeah. Leadership, yeah. You know, and that's what you're saying. It's great yeah. to say this is a precinct, but it's a precinct in the city. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, your point about <coughs> process is who's leading the process, who's yeah. the custodian of the public benefit. You know? yeah. and I think that's a really important kind of question. And, and traditionally, that's been the public sector. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting. Your example of the London Square is really interesting. And it, it brought to mind actually for around the room, and I don't want to yeah, get yeah, yeah, yeah. too much into that, no, so. except to say that um, what's being said there is, oh, um, the public sector can't deliver this, mm -hmm. can't deliver the parts of this. So we need to give it to a media you know, and, and, and we need to um, trust that they will, you know, with some pushing and shoving, Well, I just think, yes, it's I don't buy that. I don't buy that. I, 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 I think, I mean, the BDA gives this government to be yeah. custodian. Oh, it does. No, I do. But the question yeah, is, I think is the question is, I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm, 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 uh, a couple of things that I've got this. The, um, I'm convinced, I used to work for a, a Labour government in the, uh, the UK, and they didn't have any idea what government was for either. You know, um, <laughs> they, 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 they just thought, they, they convinced themselves of neoliberal platitudes. They, they couldn't think of anything for government to do, you know. <laughs> uh, and it's the same over here for some we, we think it's very left wing, we think of, you know, <coughs> having governance in this way. It's not particularly because it makes sense in a complex environment where there's so many players, you know. Um, but I'll give you an example. I, it's my favourite because uh, several of my friends got sacked. For, uh, that's not the nice bit, I just think it's quite interesting. To think <laughs> they, they, they think, I, I'm sure they would think quite rightly that was a very decadent way to start this. I think I'll start again. Um, so, so the Olympics was a very fascinating process where so my friends were involved in suddenly faced with the possibility of having to buy all the land for the London Development for the, by the London Development Agency for the Olympics. Of course there were nine hundred small businesses. Mm. Right? That's a large number of competing partners so nine hundred. Uh, they had a pro this is a this is a punchline, they had a in the background they had a compulsory purchase process. Mm. Underway, but, but you know, and a time and a deadline. But the deadline was a was a was a, a poison chalice actually because it, it gave the real power to the to people on the ground. Say, so, yeah, oh well, you know, the process will bugger off. I think you know, Olympics in 2012, you know, maybe. <laughs> so so we they ended up buying about five or six hundred of them, but still had loads of them right at the end of the process. But that thing about compulsory purchase is, a, is an interesting. You know, it's very very rarely used, uh, and it was actually not that used as much as I, I would have thought in, in Britain. But it's, you know, it, it is feasible within certain circumstances, and I think having a public body so 
So for example, that's why we're in favor of development cooperation sometimes, because I, I give you a parable. I, mean, I created this development cooperation in East London called the Thamesgate Development Corporation that was suboptimal uh, and didn't deliver what a proper development corporation would have done because we didn't take planning powers away from the local councils. I didn't. I, I concocted a fiction to myself that uh, that they would play ball, but we didn't need to take planning powers away. They, they didn't play ball, and so we delivered a lot less. So I think there are there are the reason why we're generalising, of course, is the, the real irony of this discussion. Of course, you're from the academic background, but you want to do the kind of you want to talk. I think about writing a very real deal making that you have to do. We want to generalise about principle to uh, to, to, uh, to actually give it the kind of academic spin. But uh, punchline is this: I think, <coughs> that if you can get a unified, how do you get to a unified vision? Is one thing, and that I think is the project sponsor. I think we need to kind of look through the stages of this thing. There is a kind of project sponsor role. Now, are you the project sponsor for the precinct? That's one way of looking at it. And then the project sponsor's role is not necessarily to deliver this thing, but to get everyone to buy in to the proposition, which then goes to phase two, which is how to make that commercially real thing that he's going to deliver. That. So I think the first thing is, is, every, is the proposition clear? Number one, have you defined the But then there's the ongoing day-to-day -day maintenance. What are the, you know, how do you mean the maintenance of what, sorry? Of uh, whatever it is, I guess, that you're... I'm assuming I'm thinking through, for example, the UPN. Yeah. Uh, assuming that then there's multiple stakeholder uh, buy-in to the project, yeah. to aspects of the project. It could mean a bigger project, it could mean a spine of a precinct that has, you know, uh, both a kind of conceptual framework, I guess, but also actual... Uh, well, I'm yeah. uh, well, I mean, one, one life is full of the plate spinning stuff where you have to keep everything in account. Mm. But isn't there also, I think one of the things that's wrong about when the public sector tries to do the project sponsor role, um, partly is about motivation, in that you know, it doesn't have enough skin in the game, you know, why does it really want to do it? Who's the who gets the benefit from mm. it? Not, you know, commercial people just say to themselves, that's £10 million pounds of it. That, that's a really interesting motivation. Um, yeah. Is the capacity they put into it that the uh, you know the team <coughs> that uh, say Renly's or Canary Wharf Group put together like a big team to, to define the project? We tend to shy. We, we we don't staff up. We don't put enough money in the public sector in that moment because it's like wasted strategic thinking money. Mm -hmm. I, I'm saying to you that I think that part of what you're talking about is is there enough capacity mm -hmm. behind the project sponsors' mm -hmm. initial stages. But to actually make sure that it's all... I think in the best too, there's a lot of different models. Yeah. Right, there's a model right, like right. a ship, a model of a place manager. There's right. a model of a business improvement system. A model. There are numerous models of right. empowering people to be the activator or custodian. Right. That thinking hasn't really happened yet. Necessarily, I mean, I'm sure the ship would think, at the moment, you'll automatically be the place manager. Yeah. But there are other models. And it would be right. interesting to think in an innovative way about what... I like that. I'm going to think it's good with you. I'm very much against people inventing idiosyncratic things if they're off-the-shelf things. I mean, so ship has got a structure and a delivery capacity, so that needs to be explored. I'm sure you'd like lots of other projects. <laughs> I think we've got loads of projects on, but you know, they're very experienced. That's one model, but there are other, other, other models. Of I think the testing of models mm. is a really good thing to do in the, in the early stages. Mm. An interesting point that struck me, though, is the comments I heard about that leads me to ask who really is the project sponsor? Because it seems to me as if quite a few people actually think they're the project sponsor, or if they don't think they're the project sponsor, are wondering whether they should be. So I'm not sure from what I've heard today that anybody really feels that degree of empowerment at the moment, and that <coughs> maybe until that's fully resolved and a way's worked out, that we're not going to see a more unified. Who paid for it? UTS. <laughs> the UPN. The vast majority of the investment in this precinct is coming from this university, by far. That doesn't make us a sponsor. In answer to your question, in order to get a sponsor, you need to define the project. We are not talking about the UPN. We are talking about the precinct. In order 
order to have a leader, you need to have an environment which is egoless. In a public environment, that is impossible. <laughs> Every public entity is ego driven, is patch driven, is power driven. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, if you could define a project and you had a, uh, an institution or organization, that was egoless, but did have the ability to catalyze discussions and to facilitate outcomes that were for the benefit of all, they should be the project sponsor. Now that may be a good role for a university to play. And I'm not putting ourselves forward to do that, but you could, for all I care, I think the university of Sydney could do it. Somebody that doesn't have the ego doesn't have the patch to defend, but does have a good outcome for a precinct for all the players in the precinct. Having said that, whoever does it has to have a respect for the greater ownership. This precinct is part of the city. The city is part of the state. So if everybody can respect the ultimate aims of those other organizations as they facilitate the discussions, you're probably going to get a good outcome. But step one, define the project. That's the stuff I wanted to end on before Sorry. Tasha cut me off. Like, what, I, what, you, what, you went through your presentation. What, <laughs> what we've learnt from uh, dealing with three tiers of government and uh, multiple stakeholders and everything, so I'll, I'll keep passing you later, um, was, uh, and maybe you can't, I can't seem to get it any bigger, but with the project formation, there's kind of three steps that we understand, Pro project formation, project delivery and project management, but there's, there needs to be governance in each of these things. Um, and with the talk of leadership and project sponsor is a really um, uh, interesting part of trying to understand how that collaboration and governance works. Um, but th the other stuff that we've learned through that is having the right groups with the right people and with the right relationships. Um, and that um, you actually have to go through a sustained um, engagement process at the beginning that you can sustain through the project, through those different phases, um, and that that's worth investing time and money into, um, so you get that buy-in support and continued sort of ownership of, of the project. But the other stuff that we're finding, it seems that there's an issue, and I don't know the detail at all, I mean, my history of Sydney and governance and politics is kind of 10 years old now. Um, I remember Schiffer and Government Architects Office and planning and and all of the bun fighting between the different silos, but um, it would seem to me that there needs to be some sort of development of not just the vision that you're after, but the standards of the codes or the things around it that enable it, that support it. And then somebody kind of independent who doesn't have a financial agenda or a vested interest in any particular part of it, who can kind of interpret the project and the direction of the project against that shared vision and the, the codes that support that, so kind of that independent arbiter. I mean, that's where I suggest the, uh, in South Australia the role of the government architect, right? Because that role is, there is no, uh, it's not a delivery agency, there is no vested interest in anything other than the best public domain outcome. Um, <coughs> but I, 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 I just offer that up as, um, are the way to think about it. One of, one of the paradoxes, or is if, if ever you've worked in local government like I have, uh, many people do, is that uh, it's rather like what happened with the Olympic uh, legacy where the, uh, in, in London, where um, the people who are most knowledgeable and passionate about their area, and excuse my technical phrase, but fear and shit, you know, people who are local councillors, they really were, in principle, the client for the legacy and for the games. The problem was their capacity to actually um, deliver some of these things, so that the so it was always, and I was very difficult to me, I, I believe both those things at the same time. You know, the local, local government is absolutely ineradicable and correctly so part of you know um, defining the vision for the area and the values that we should incorporate in this in, in this development. But actually, they should then have the objectivity to know that they, they, there needs to be a special purpose vehicle. I mean, the shipper example is really quite important. Of, you know, that I, I think there's a division of labour there, you know, that, that you know, a shipper can do stuff. But actually, the council tried to do it, they always find political reasons to interfere with the delivery.
process, you have to take it away. And that's a big moment of discovery for them. And it was the, the best thing happened to these East London local authorities was they decided that they could not do that second moment, but that they wanted to keep that second moment honest by invigilating it and by making sure that this delivery vehicle was actually delivering the values that we were. And at the same time, there are things that local government only could do and that's to run services and to make a place. So they weren't out of this entirely. But I think that, that understanding of the of the strategic moment that then becomes the delivery moment, I think, is a big, is a big thing. I mean, but this thing is, that we talk about who is the project sponsor and how, you know, that, that hasn't yet been defined because there is no project, that chicken and egg project. Get back to um, something I was talking about earlier, which was the initial discussions surrounding the UPN and the city taking on the role of uh, creating the UPN committee and then changing it to the USEP committee. And the <coughs> The city became the sponsor. Uh, the university filled a role within that committee, which became the uh, I'll call it facilitator, uh, the vision creator, or the assistant. We we provided assistance in creating a vision, um, but we did that largely through the fact that we have money. Uh, it, money, yeah. money, money talks. Yeah. Everybody else, whether it be the powerhouse, whether it be Shifo, whether it be the city, said, I'm sorry, we can't do any of that because we don't have any money. And when we turned around and said, well, look, we're going to put a lot of money into this, but if you don't charge us such 94s, we'll put the money back into the city. All of a sudden, it freed up a lot of thought processes. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> we continue to facilitate. Are we a sponsor? Define sponsor. It's the city's space. It's, it's Shifo's land. It's it's a partnership, it is. But, but aren't you the sponsor whether you like it or not, given that sort of, um, you know, sheer uh, proportion of financial kind of, you know, input? Well, and given the sheer percentage of change to the principles that you're going to enact. Yeah. So clearly, you're a catalyst. That's right. But, but you're also the, the greatest beneficiary in terms of immediate stakeholders. Now, I'm not sure about that part. Mm -hmm. I actually think there are the entire precinct surrounding the university is going to, fit, going to benefit far more than the university will. I think that the, the tourists coming out of South Carolina Harbor, the, the whole psyche redevelopment, all of that is, is a large beneficiary to this. So isn't that then where you're the um, um, philanthropist or the, uh, the what was the word I'm looking for? The um, uh, civic actor. There's someone interested in civic mm. civic benefit. I think that's the thing that's been mm. slightly shocking to me in some of our conversations is the degree to which um, that's not that's not valued. Actually, mm. like just the, our responsibility as civic actors. Mm. <coughs> yeah. Because I, every gesture we make has such a fundamental, has such a profound, a generative effect on the city around yeah. us, and I think that's. Particularly with this work that we're doing with the Wembley building in the centre of the UPN, yeah. you know, this is, you know, <laughs> our where favorite we're topic. It's, sorry, our favourite topic. Yeah, which is where we're negotiating with a, a private building owner. You know, it's not an institution all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and um, there's a real resistance within, you know, the, you know, the UTS is a very diverse organisation, and there's a certain resistance within people that we're on PCGs with about our responsibility as, you know, to uh, to the civic benefit around us, and I yeah. find that kind yeah. of, uh, it's not a shock. I, I, I feel ashamed then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, I, yeah. but I think that there's another way of looking at this, which is that there are two lexicons, but they are, they, they, if you're in the public sector, you have two both. Right. So, so one is about uh, promoting public value. Sure, that is, yeah. right? And there are yeah. different ways to do that, sure. and this is a sure. project that's going to have public value. Sure. <coughs> but at the end of the day, you might have to do something about it to pay for it. Sure. And I think that yeah. Sorry to cut you off. That comes back to what you were saying earlier. This is a deal. You referred to me as an academic before, and I understand you may think that. I'm a businessman. Um, I come into this, this sector from the dark side. Yeah, he's coming out. Um, I should be wearing black clothing. I think that's the side. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but what's coming out of all of this facilitation discussion that the city and SHIFA and UTS and others are, are working through is the fact that this is a deal, and there are benefits for all concerned, whether it be a civic yes. benefit yeah. or whether it be truly a financial benefit. Yeah. 
everybody's getting something out of this. So just from my experience, it's the healthy stuff. So everyone has yeah. a stake in it, whether it's financial or value. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I, I guess um, our experience is telling us to be clear about that, to yeah. articulate that, and have everyone in the room understand mm -hmm. that, so that then when you're dealing with the compromises, when you, which is a necessary part of any sort of contractual relationship or partnership, mm -hmm. um, you're understanding how the others in the room are going through those same mm -hmm. compromises, yeah. which kind of might not all be equal, but there's an equality in the sort of what you're going through. Yeah. That, that distinction makes sense. Yeah, it's well understanding the, the different agendas and how we how this project then delivers those people's agendas for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what the, yeah. the public order process is. There's an old communist joke which I always I want to inflict on you, which is uh, which is that uh, there was a, allegedly a, going to be a conference of uh, communist economists back in the 60s and uh, throughout the entire world and they were meeting up in Prague and one bloke said, uh, got up and he said, I've just worked this out that when we have world communism, we need to keep one country capitalist. And they said, well, why is that? They said, because so that we'll know how much things cost. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I do think it's a kind of uh, very instructive thing. The, uh, I've been involved in both sides of this, and I think the punchline is just is understanding what the payback is for whether it's a private or public yeah. body. Uh, but I think the trouble is that inertia is a very great, uh, I mean, a very great force in human life. Less so in commercial life, you know, mm -hmm. that is an That's where the excitement of the vision comes in. You know, it's not as if some of these other entities don't have money. You know, the city is not bankrupt. The city is just, yeah. it's doing lots of improvements. It's just spent a lot of money building the white place and so on. Yeah. Yeah. If, if and the other entities will get on board, if they see some benefit for themselves, that they, in a more immediate way, but they also see a longer term and less tangible benefit. You know, uh, I, I, I think it comes back a lot of this to um, the vision and what flows from it attract a lot of people and the excitement. Mm -hmm. And if there are then practical things that can be done to mm -hmm. implement this, it yeah. doesn't mean you do it all at once. A no. demonstration project can be fantastic because it really shows people what can come from into doing this. Yeah. University might put in more money than, than other players, and that might be appropriate in terms of where the world wants to be seen you know, as, a, as a neighbor and a, an entity in your city. It's not a significant entity. But others will contribute as well. They can see the value. We're certainly hoping so. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I don't think it's, um, yeah, I, think it's I don't like, think it's unwise yeah. or, or, or inappropriate to lose sight of that or to, to be a pessimist and say, well, To me, that's the, the, the yeah. vision needs to be multivalent. It needs oh, to be on yeah. numerous levels doing different things. It's not just about the way it will work. It's not just about the way it will look. It's not just about the choice of materials and landscaping, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But it's, it's uh, how it's programmed, yeah. how people work together, how they actually collaborate. Mm -hmm. You know, you there's, there's as much value in being innovative in the relationships of people creating this as there is in mm -hmm. the thing itself. Mm -hmm. so um, that's why that, that issue of looking at the model the software and the hardware. Exactly, the software and the hardware together. But, but to, to, my, to my mind, I, I mean, I can say this because I have no vested interest and I'm, I'm going back home to <laughs> my temporary home to Adelaide. I think you're going home. Well, yeah. <laughs> it would seem to me that there is a huge opportunity for UTS in this space because you are in the hardware and the software sort of space. You're in the innovation space. You're in the practical research space. You're in the new learning space. You kind of... Everything that we've talked about set to me says that UTS has the potential to be the leader mm -hmm. in this. And if you're, you are talking about the idea of 
doing that without ego is the way to a successful project, the very fact that you can state that in this sort of context to me says that you have that potential. It's, a, it's an interesting thing here. I like, there was a word you used at the start there, but narrative. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I give an example about any, a narrative that became extremely powerful. Um, and um, I, I was laughed at it when I did this thing. Um, people who worked for me laughed at me. Uh, back in 1997, there was a desperate half an hour before I commissioned a, before I put the text in for an advert that we booked in the property press <coughs> in East London, the Estates Gazette. And I was desperate. There was a, a photograph of some empty dockland in East London. I was working with this thing called the Thames Gateway Partnership, which became this big project. It was, it was three of us. There was three of us, uh, uh, two, two, two men and a dog, and I, I was the dog, actually. And <laughs> what happened was this. So I just, I became chief executive. But, but it was just, I just looked at this and thought, London's going east, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody laughed at me because they were all in London. <laughs> it would be London's going east. And I said, oh, London's going east. London's going east became a, 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 the strap line of the whole of, it, it, it captured the London flag. It became, mm -hmm. you know, the Olympics is, is it, I, I, you know, I, I know this, I'm one of about 10 people who claim they dragged the Olympics to East London. But at the, at the start of it was a branding, right? And then we yeah. captured, um, we captured the political process with this thing, who then actually delivered lots of projects around this extraordinary proposition that there was a new government at the time of the Blair government. And I, my point of this is that there is a moment where, and this is the design discussion becoming, you know, I had a big, I had a big argument in, 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 in England around um, design-led regeneration. Lord Rogers had done this thing about the urban passports. And I disagreed because I, I felt that uh, what we ended up with, actually, was town centres that were tarted up, but there was no economic life for them. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, the, so the economic led master plan process, I'm very, very interested in. Right? I believe in economic master plans. And so, for example, that means for this, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a city state, like Sydney, whose contribution to Australian GDP a dozen years ago was that it made up 27% of Australian GDP, and now makes up maybe 17 or 18% of Australian GDP. It's partly because of the miners, but it's also Melbourne has come forward with 20% of Australian GDP. So, you know, it's not just the miners, and it's not just the, we, we've gone backwards a bit. There is a, a moment for a, an anchor project for a new economic future for Sydney. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of a better one that has got something to do with innovation and digital mm -hmm. uh, matters around a university in the middle of town. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so it feels to me like a game changer in productivity yeah, 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 yeah. event. And it needs to be understood like that. Now that can capture the attention of politicians and who will then tell the public sector what to do. Um, so I think you, 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 I think there's a moment where you have to raise the the narrative up there and do a bit of politicking, a bit more to engage people and not just the institutions around the vision, so that they then put pressure on the politician to take this seriously. But that's a risky thing to do because politicians get resentful um, if you whip up people against them in any way whatsoever. So you know, but I just think that otherwise you're going to have this conversation in two years' time. You know, it needs to be raised up a level mm -hmm. to become the critical. The critical investment for city. And I think that you, you're saying we're raising people up against them, but what we're actually looking to do, and we've started, is to get the politicians thinking in a particular way, which actually we're going to support, as opposed to rile people up against them. You've, you've indicated what's the, the rationale, I'll put it in my words, because yeah. I don't speak architect. Um, <laughs> you're already very lucky, man. <laughs> What's the rationale for a UPM? Why are we going to do anything there? Uh, and what the university's been saying for quite some time now is if you take this precinct and you look one kilometer around it, you've got 80% of the state's creative industry. Um, so when I talk to people, it's a case of never try and create something that doesn't have a natural com agglomeration or reason for coming together. It's already here. Why aren't we leveraging that? Why aren't we helping it along? So the UPN just becomes a natural place, setting, whatever, for the whole creative industry, education, precinct, entertainment. When you look at things that fail, and I, I'll be very blunt here, I think, uh, for example, uh, the, what do they call it, the Entertainment Center out of Fox Studios? Mm -hmm. It's a failure. Yeah. It's dead. Okay. Because somebody tried to force something yeah. into an area 
There was no reason for it to be there. Somebody thought it was a good idea. You don't have to force this precinct. You don't have to force this part of the city. It's already the creative precinct. Just create, uh, design it to support all those industries from an economic standpoint that are already there. Can, can I try? The spaces of the temp, I mean, this is something I'm doing in Hong Kong. Yeah. It's, we're living in a very dense environment. We need to do a lot of kind of cultural programming, pop up events, uh, festivals, Biennale, yeah. to kind of activate the city. But spaces often we don't have, which is like yeah. big public plazas. So you're working in very intimate, small pockets. And I think that's the fabric of the urbanism that could be amazing potential. Mm -hmm. The strip and the yeah. But it's the spatial, it's, it's yeah. the narrative, it's the story that links everything together yeah. on one level, but it's the spatial quality of innovation yeah. that we've got to kind of work out what yeah. that is. And, that's and pretty how the, in, the spatial yeah. infrastructure that yeah. brings those things together. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem I can imagine that the stakeholders, the institutions would start to gather around. Yeah. Can, can, can I offer two things that maybe, <coughs> sorry, I'll be really quick that maybe it's not just an economic-led master plan, it's a sustainable-led master plan. I don't mean sustainability as environmentally alone. I mean a social, economic, and environmental sustainability-led approach to things. Uh, and the other thing, um, Ed Glaser, trying for the city, mm -hmm. an economist, writing about the value of the city, said almost exactly the same thing that you just said, that it is about um, where people come together and where they're successful, and that's why Silicon Valley works the way it does. Yep. That's because people need that interaction. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, that's the connection with yeah. you know Hong Kong needing yeah, yeah. a public space for people to do it. And this precinct is this the natural. The space well, I, I, I think the problem is that it provides the opportunity, yeah. but it's not a natural space because of the urban fabric, the way buildings are being built mm -hmm. to boundaries, looking after their own sites mm -hmm. and not having any generosity to that public space. You just got to look yeah. at the backs yeah. of all those buildings. The backs yeah. But if you're saying this is a new living, this could be your new living room, yeah. mm -hmm. right? This is your new car. Yeah. But you've got to have the bedroom, the kitchen, and then all the other activation. If those things don't happen in time, people will die. I mean, look at Martin Place. Yeah. You've got businesses <coughs> moving out. It's a great public space. Mm -hmm. The bones are there. Yeah. If you don't have that engagement, it's in the space. Yeah. 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 But what's around Martin Place, or and then I'll let you say something like this. <laughs> what's around Martin Place? has no activation. Those businesses are not activation businesses. They are come in and buy something from us, uh, do something in there, but they've got nothing to do with that public space. But they could be. They could be. They if could you delegate change, the it. first two floors of their building. I agree. Yeah. To create totally that. agree. And this is the kind of move that has to Sorry, Mike. Michael. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just a couple of conversations here coming back to two locations. Two late. I was just picking up on something that Patrick made just a moment ago. I wasn't going to contribute to this, but I was <coughs> something that Patrick uh, just raised just then, and that was, uh, <coughs> again, the relationship between this precinct and the city. And I think that was the point that we were trying to draw attention to earlier on today. And that was that the, uh, it's this business about asking the right questions. I'll go to that point again. The, the starting point for yeah. thinking about the UPN, I don't think it's the UPN itself, but I think that's the end point, not the start point. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's not happening in the kind of chronological mm -hmm. incremental way you might normally. Yeah. The, 
yeah. but when has it ever happened like that? I mean, every project that you know, I kind of felt like I outlined a, a perfect process, but it's as messy as all get out. And, and yeah, you want all everybody in the room to have the conversation, but you know everybody's talking to everybody else yeah. in the background and yeah, making yeah. all these deals. And yeah, I mean, I think reality. we all agree that any kind of urban move you make in a city has to be multi-scalar. I mean, that's you know, that's, that's what that's saying. And this, in the context of this design studio, that this is the, that we're having this conversation on the occasion of is um, setting up the problem at, at, at the, the question of what is the size of the urban quarter that the EPM forms a spine of. You know, so it's an open question at the moment how big this quarter is. I don't think it should be quite big, it should be near project. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Ask a different set of questions. Yeah. And then things start to get Yeah, yeah, so I just quite a Find a different sponsor. Since yeah. 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 when you get to it. <laughs> when you get to it. When you get done to it. I When you get down to the, the land deals, you want to make a piece of land rather than a small piece of land as well, because you can always, you know, you always regret not having a bigger piece of land. Uh, and you can always sell the bigger piece of land, you need a small piece of land. But Ben will tell you, it's a good way of concluding this, this interesting discussion about uh, what I, my recovering, I, had, I made a massive faux pas in what I, I kind of enjoyed doing it in, uh, in Adelaide. Oh. Uh, and it was in precisely on this topic of scale, economic purpose of a city, and then plays to the, the what I consider to be the smaller uh, urban design tasks around you know streetscapes and corners and stuff. But somebody asked me a question in this uh, part of this process, and the question I formed the view that the questioner meant because uh, it was all about uh, um, the intricacies of urban design. They meant in their head they were thinking of Jan Gale, right? Now, I've got to step back and tell you that there's, there's, a, there's an angsty background to my response on this thing, because three years before I ran a conference in Wales, at, at which a rather sneering um, representative on earth of Jan Gale um, that annoyed the hell out of me, and so I, I bore a grudge. I, I never confessed it to myself, I bore a grudge. So when, so when, and also, over here, I suddenly realised that Jan Gale, who was lovely, uh, were, uh, is selling is selling, is selling Swedish vernacular or Danish vernacular yeah. internationally, yeah. which I sort of think is counterintuitive, you see. So, uh, so anyway, we've had all this going through my head. So <laughs> this questioner asked me, what did I think? And I said, oh, I think they must be talking about Jan Gale. So I say, ah, no, Jan Gale is great. You, you will confirm, I said, Jan, I said, Jan Gale is great. But in my mind, he is a miniaturist who's brilliant at playing that. But, you know, we need to stand back and look at the big picture for the city. And I don't think he's got anything to say about that. And the chairman said, Young Gale, what do you think about what's in the news? True story. Because nobody told me it was that. <laughs> <laughs> Would have taken that absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I think I like I'm, on that note, it's 7 o'clock. Yeah. You guys have been here since most of you 8.30 this morning. I want to congratulate you on your stay Thank you so much.